No Further Information, a podcast for cops by cops, but strangely about pillow stuffing. Does the industry still use real feathers? This is part two of Bob, last week's special guest, whom I'm endeared to because the kid means the world to me. Also, he's holding my family hostage. Weirdly, his only demands are sexual. Will I give in? Find out today. Let's hear from my friend and the only cop in the world who's nine and a half years old. At least that's how he sounds and looks. And also poops. Hi, I'm Officer Bob, and I'm a police officer in the state of Texas. Have you ever run into an incident where you had to take enforcement action or confront another cop? Not a cop. Not me personally. When I did go down to an, another substation, mm-hmm. one of my first time, you know, one of my first shifts over there, I got no idea where I'm going. I'm right with right. a classmate who. Right, right. You know, I got no idea. Relying we, we heavily up, on your map, you know. Right. We, <laughs> ended, we ended up having a call where. There was an officer who said he was at, you know, one of the hospitals and he was going to do something to himself. And uh, another supervisor who had been there for a, a while knew this guy and was able to actually call him personally on his personal phone and talk to him. And they, you know, I still don't know exactly what happened, but mm-hmm. that, I'm assuming everything worked out. But for me personally, no. Uh, military, yeah, I have. You know, guys that led overseas and lost some people or this is what's being told to me you know they they lose some people and they come back and they they carry that weight and they they do want to harm themselves you know their self-worth is real low so i I have interacted with people like that yeah and was it a positive interaction were they um adverse to you get the fuck away like you know I, i mean how how did that go yeah we you know we you just try to find something to, you know, you try to break down those barriers and then have something in common with them or something just to get his attention and get him to agree to the help, right? Because if you just go in there, oh, well, you're, you know, you're suicidal, I'm going to put you in cuss. You know, some of those guys, they're not they're not going. Mm-hmm. Um, so you just try to find something that works and talk about something, yeah, you got kids, you got wives, you know, hey, well, those guys wouldn't want you to do in this, man, like, I want to get you help, like, there's things that can help, I know you feel like you, you can't, no one's going to help you, no one understands, but I, I promise you, you're not the only one. Eventually, he, he, he did decide to, to go, and, I, you know, I, I hope it, I hope it worked, I never went back there, which, that's, that's a plus, so. That's something. Yeah. You weren't a cop on 7-7, you weren't on the job yet, were you? I was not. Were you in the academy or applying? I feel so, like you were close to the space. Right. Um, right before, you know, I actually went on a vacation. They called, they called me and they were like, hey, you want to you wanna start next Wednesday? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, up in northern U.S. Just an hour never. Because mm-hmm. I knew once I started, it was going to be two years before you get to travel. You know, you have... Eight nine months in academy, mm-hmm. six months field mm-hmm. training. You're mm-hmm. you're not going anywhere for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, they were like, "No, we'll just take you to the next class." So I was like, "Cool." And I, I went on my vacation. And when I was on my vacation, the night before we head back is when seven seven happened. And I remember, you know, the hotels we stopped at on the way back. You know, it's it's plain and all my friends and family. Hey, you know, if you don't, because I knew I was going. You know. You're going to the next class. I was in the next class, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they're all, you know, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. You know, no one's going to think any different of you. And What's your reaction to that? Oh, not not doing it at that point. It was, wasn't, not even, it wasn't an option. That's good. Not I'm glad option. you said that. You didn't have a, a fucking iota of, well, it wasn't even a, it wasn't even a thing. Right. I mean, I remember thinking, oh, holy shit, this is actually, you know, that's a possibility, like, that can actually happen, but 
and it's you know, scary. You don't know. You don't know you know, what if you get out there and something happens. But eventually, you, you just do it, and one foot in front of the other, and next thing you know, you're seven years in. Well, does your spouse say, listen, motherfucker, there's no fucking way I'm letting you do this. I'm not going to be a fucking widow at, you know, you guys are young. Uh, there's no way I'm going to be a widow in my 20s with a fucking kid. Right. Um, you know, I think she knows, knew that I, that I wanted to do it. Mm. And probably part of her knew that if she did tell me not to do it, I probably was still going to do it. So she never, she never told me. Mm. She, she would say things like, you know, I'm, anyway, we're going to figure it out. We'll, you know, I'll support you either way. But she never directly told me, no, I don't want you to do that. I'm sure there was many sure. nights that she couldn't sleep sure. because, because she's got no idea. That's so. a good, that's a good partner. That's a good partner. Yeah, she's, you know, she's pretty awesome. She's okay. She's awesome. She's, she's, <laughs> she's, 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 she's okay. You know, um, she's going she's to listen to this, right? Yeah. yeah. She's, oh, she's super I cool. I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best ever. The fucking okay. greatest I can. I was going to say, greatest wife I've ever had, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back, though, and I, would, I really want to... I wanted you on here for a long time. Um, because, I'm, I, I, for me, you know, it's about psyche. I'm going to take you back to long before you ever even fucking got on the job. And we were standing outside a fucking Dickie's barbecue in the middle of fucking nowhere. And a police... I mean, a news report comes out and says, this city is overrun they are down x number of i mean we're talking triple digit offices they're down they've got priority one calls for service holding stacked up 10 15 20 high and you and i had this weird conversation where it was like that didn't repel us in fact i i want to say and i don't want to speak for you but it seemed to me that it attracted you and I'm, I'm curious as, as to me that mentality. Again, this is long before you ever thought about the job. Right. Or at least, you know, f far from ever even kind of, you know, applying, academy, you know. And I'm curious as to that mentality. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, you get into the job. If, you, if this is one of the reasons you get into the job is to help people, well, why not go help the people who actually need help go help the other officer go help the other departments that actually need help mm -hmm. i mean you got you're this you pages and pages and i remember one night i called like it was like 98 calls holding not every single one of them was a shooting or sure, or sure. anything, but, you know but i mean still yeah. week and a half old theft you know someone got their right saw stolen on the back of their truck you know, a week ago and they're still waiting mm -hmm. but no, I think that attracted me. I remember somebody I knew always told, you know, said, if you want to be a real cop, come to the area. Whatever reason that stuck, and I was like, well, I'm going to go be a real cop. And plus, it, they need they needed, they needed help. I figured, you know, I'd go down there and. You were, um, I, I, I would paint you as a very attractive candidate, having, you know, hired people and been an administrator myself. I, I submit, I humbly submit that um, other requirements aside, you know, education or military or whatever, right? but uh, requirements aside, I feel like you would have been a viable candidate in any department. So you could have easily, easily walked on, you know, you know like, like college football, like a walk-on freshman. You could have walked on anywhere. You could have walked on to some cushy, no, you know, northern, no crime, you know, department. But... You said, oh, that attracts me because of the reasons I want to do the job. Right. So I'm going to come out because I need that experience. And boy, did you get it. And um, I, I, I think uh, that's a quality that I can't quite put my finger on. What makes us want to do that? What makes us want to say, oh, this is bad, but I really want to do it. You know, I, I, my favorite saying is, this is the fucking worst job in the world. And it's the fucking best job in the world. It and, is. And, and I, I, I don't know what attracts us to that. Why? why right. You know. When people can, ask me. Can you help me understand that? Because I don't fucking don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of us. Man, are, I, got, I think all of us in this yeah, room. I said, I said no hard questions, man. Uh, yeah. I, got, I got no idea. There's just something, I, I guess, an internal calling, if, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to be cliche, mm -hmm. but that's, 
there's just something something that attracts you to it. And I don't know that you can really put a finger on it. It's intangible. Right. Something different every day. Right. And depending, a lot, a lot of experience. You know, you're gonna if you want to help people, you're gonna help. You're gonna help a lot of people. There are a lot of people who don't want your help. A lot of people who don't know they need your help, but you're gonna you're gonna make an impact, and you're gonna see stuff and do stuff, and you you're gonna. I feel like going to a large metropolitan city is when you fully get the police experience. Do you feel like it would have been different? Had you gone to the podunk? Absolutely. Absolutely. You'd be, you'd be a different person. Absolutely. So you're appreciative for having that those 90 calls holding experience. Right. And I'm with you. I'm yeah. with you. I'm just... Um, I, would, I would do it all over again. Yeah. You know, I, you know, yeah, I yeah. never... You know, I, I loved the police department. I was very proud to be a police officer. I didn't leave because I hated the department. Right. It was just time for me to go. And it's better for your family. It was a lot, a lot better for my family. You a lot talked about for, it at for the, me. You talked about it at the top, which is you know you actually get to tuck your kids in that night, right? Um, okay, so you're no longer a representative of your former large department, but your former large department does get a lot of complaints, right? And I say this in the face of, you know, well, you know, if you call this department. They never show up anyway, right? They don't care. And then people love to, and you and I have gotten into this because people love to fucking talk shit about the large department in their area. Mm -hmm. uh, you're you're a smaller agency. You're a suburb. You're like, oh, and I I love this line. I love this line. I would ne you could never get me to go work for big city PD because I did it really, really. I don't think you could fucking handle it. And I have personal experiences with this department because they were there for me multiple times. Multiple times. They were there for my friends. They were there for other offices. And so people love to talk a lot of shit about the department. And then, and I, I promise I'm going somewhere with this, okay, not only are we fighting ourselves when the real enemy is beyond the gates, then comes 2020, where every single fucking person hates you. Yep. A bunch of us were murdered. We're fighting amongst ourselves. You got a lot of us out there doing dumb shit. And then everybody fucking hates you. And so at that point, how do you cope with that? How do you, how do you deal with it with your family? Hey, hey, babe, why don't you just stop doing it? Like, you know, do something else. Right. How do you, how do you deal with that hate? You know, I don't know that I'm the best person to ask because I don't know that I, that I did, because eventually all of that is what drove me to leave. Right. Um. Like I had to take a break. You know, being in a large department with all that going on, it's like you're you're waiting in the deep end of the pool. You can't touch the bottom. You're just waiting, waiting, waiting. Going. You know, I had to get out of there. I had to go somewhere else and go you know sit on the stairs with my feet in the pool not get all the way out of the pool but just have my feet in the pool for a you, little bit you can't you can't use my oh i'm gonna use my it. analogy I'm using it but um you know and and man you just get tired you just get exhausted oh. and you lose a little bit of faith um and i promise this isn't a religious thing but you know when do you you personally when do you regain that faith you pick yourself back up off your feet you and we'll talk about your your transition right in, in your employer and then you say okay all right i, I, I might I, I still got a little bit left in me when do you when do you reach that stage the evolution the metamorphosis for me it was a change i needed i needed to slow down a little bit and kind of figure out why i actually started in the first place mm -hmm. um and which which i you know i feel like i did and but it's different for everybody. It's, it's almost like a relationship. You know, you you fight, you get tired of the person, and sometimes you need to remember why you you hooked up with this broad. You know, she was hot at one point, right? From <laughs> Nashville. Like, I'm not talking about your person in particular situation, but now she got, you know, big fat ass, always standing in front of the fucking TV, can't cook a meal. But then you remember, like, oh, she's loving, she's caring, and she gives me a lot. And so you kind of rekindle your relationship with the job. You change employers, and 
smaller agency, lower call load, maybe a little more freedom for self-initiated, but it comes with its, you know, everything, everything in life is a balance, right? So pos positives and negatives from going from a large department to small podunk. I mean, at least I think it's podunk. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, honestly, for me, the biggest, the biggest positive is, like I said, I, you know, I, I work where I live. Right. I wouldn't. There's no this way This department you, right. wouldn't have been on my radar. It's right. not a, you're not a bad department. There's you know good people there and there are there are there are 500 departments like it in Texas. Right. Um, for me, it was it's honestly the community. I you, you drive down the street and you know people are waving at you, people stopping at you, and you got to argue with people to not pay for your food and just <laughs> things like that help remind them. Okay. You know, there's people out here that need us, people out here who want us. Back in 2020, you couldn't hear any of that. None of it. The opposite, in fact. Exactly. Um, and, and big change for you, right? Big change. Absolutely. But, again, there's a Lunch. price with that. No free lunches in nature. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's definitely a price with that, especially when you talk about administrations. Um, you know, big agencies, everybody came up through there. Everybody mm -hmm. everybody was in those trenches. Mm -hmm. You know, not that long ago, you, you have supervisors who were in the trenches with you. Smaller agencies, they there's there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of big fish, small pond. Mm -hmm. Best way I can explain it. Mm -hmm. Larger department, your bosses are going to be former POs, former patrolmen who promoted through. A large department is not going to hire Bob over here have Bob come into the large department city system for two years and then give him a gold bar. Small department, not as many cops, higher turnover. They will hire, in Texas we call it a lateral, they will hire Bob over here because he had three years at fucking doohickey fucking sheriff's office. He'll come in, hey, I like the cut of Bob's jib. We're both Asian, which is usually not the case. And I'm going to promote him after being here at small left elbow department after six months to the position of fucking deputy commandant. And right. now you have Big Dick Bob, who came from, le what did I say you were from? Left elbow sheriff's office, dippity do fucking, I forgot. I'm, I lose track of my own fucking analogies. And, and so I feel like that's a problem that plagues the small, the, the, the large department, no problem with I mean, it, I'm not saying it doesn't have problems. I'm saying the majority of this state, with so many police departments, the state has, I mean, Google, if you could fact check me, I think we have 75,000 sworn peace officers, certified peace officers, and I think we have over 800 agencies in the fucking state. And I think in the DFW area alone, I think we have over 70 agencies. I, I could be wrong. So all of this is to say, you come in from that system where it works, and then you come into this system. Uh, when I talk about pros and cons, pros definitely, I like this for you. How did your street experience in the large department where you're, you know, chasing bitches off bridges and covered in people's blood, now you're coming to Mayberry, how did that inform your patrol operations? I, I would, I'd, I'd, I'd think of it, as a, of it as a pro, but it could be a con. Can you talk to me about that? About it being a con, pro or con. I mean, your experience from the city. So having having worked at a big city, you get a lot of critical incidents. A lot of you, you have to be very very well rounded. So right. going from a big agency to a small agency in a patrol aspect that that can help you because when you do get that one of four incidents a, a year, you know you you've been there. You've been there. This was a Tuesday. Sixty. Yeah. Right. This was a Tuesday back in Agency A. Right. Um, so you have that experience. You know. You you know how to. You, you're calm under pressure. Mm -hmm. Things like that. But the con is, and I'll I'll tell you. I'll I'll, I'll tee you up for it. Listen, that may be the way they, they do things back in Big City A, but out here in Lower KC Department. And, ooh, Mr. Big Dick, and I believe, and you can stop me, but one of my pieces of advice for, to you was shut the fuck up. Don't even say City A. 
that wor- unless it's where the person lives <laughs> in their address, don't even fucking <laughs> mention it because it can be brought up against you. Absolutely, a um, lot of lot of shit talking about yeah. it. To be oh, honest, oh, Mister Big City Cop over here, yeah. look at his shit doesn't stink. But that's jealousy. I think it's jealousy. I think it's jealousy. I think it's. Uh, I think you. I think you. You know, we know the saying, right? Five years at A is going to be twenty years at B. I think that's jealousy, and uh, your uh, experience informs. And I think that's why. Um, I think that's why you. you I, I'd like to think you advance fairly quickly at your new department. <clears throat> um, a little birdie, birdie told me that you're not the biggest fan of DWIs. Um, I believe, I believe cops who go, I believe cops who, the, this, this is how you know, when the cops go, I mean, I'll do them, tells me all I need to know. When I'm like, okay, all right, all right. But, uh, and I know that in your large department, um, typically you'll have a traffic unit who will come kind of clean what you caught, so to speak, if you pull something on traffic. But can you give me a good DWI story or correct me if I'm wrong? And I know that particular traffic, the Tango unit in your big city, there's like, you know, two for the entire goddamn city. So fact check me and give me a good story. So as far as DWIs go, with the, it, I, I don't think it's that, because at my new agency, you know, they always say, oh, well, you know, you guys just called over a Tango and they, and they did it, or, or you guys just held crime scene tape and mm-hmm. this unit did it. Which isn't true. So, like you said, there's there's two DWI guys, right? And right, right. The thing is, is that we, we're just you're always going from call to call to call. So unless it was a crash and you didn't get there two hours later, it, you it was rare that you know you were actually there, there's plenty of DWIs. I'm not gonna say that, but like you're always going to a hot call or you're always going to jail. You're always going to the domestic that you're you're not running traffic. There's far less time for self initiated. Absolutely. Okay, but. Now, what's your fucking excuse? Mm. Well, you know, I'll, I'll do them, but. <laughs> Tell me about the last DWI you had. Don't, Gosh. don't, look, look, so, don't feel nervous just because I'm sitting here. Okay, all right. You're a big bad. Look at your muscles. Look at your shirt. This, the length of his sleeves tells me all I need to know. You better watch out with this motherfucker. All right, all right. See, he and I, my producer and I, both have long sleeves because we're pussies. We're pussies. You could take us. So come on, big badass. No, no. All look. All joking aside, like I'm just curious. I just want a story, and you know, I don't want you to tell me about the time you stopped a guy who was so fucking drunk and you gave him a ride home. But you've had DWI stories. You've run into them. You'll do them, and that's the important thing, right? You're not avoiding them, you know, and you're no, you're cap- and you're capable no. of doing them. Yeah, no, I won't, I won't avoid them. If I, if I stop somebody on... I, I'll even make the stop thinking, oh, this is a DWI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I get... You know, sometimes it's always well, texting or... Yeah. I had one where I was like, why don't you drive... You know, get up there. Like I'm like, you're, you're very... Obviously, I think it was ended up being like a 17-year-old girl going to the, the school for some science right. project. And she's trying to keep the hard-boiled eggs in the passenger seat from falling <laughs> and just all over the road. So I'll make the stops and so you, determine. So you picked up the egg. It was like, now, bitch. You know, like, <laughs> that's what you get for driving like a fucking asshole. You're free to leave. No, Drive no. safe. Yeah. The last DW I had was, it was at 10.30 in the morning. You guys passed out in a drive-thru and you get there. And he's, ends up saying he's just, you know, I get there. He's actually not passed out. And I actually don't smell any alcohol on or anything. But through the course of my investigation, and talking to some of the fast food employees, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of odd why you're here. Start asking him questions. He's like, oh, I was, you know, drinking and hanging out with friends. Drove over here. So I end up doing, you know, SFSTs and hook him up, take him to jail. And we get the, I ended up getting the blood back a couple of weeks later. And he was almost a point two. And I would have said that he was, so when I first started talking to him, I would have said he was sober. So let's hit on that for a second. Because... <clears throat> Did you arrest him because you trusted the SFSTs? I did, yes. Yeah, the HGN. I mean, he had six out of six clues. Because the eyes don't lie. Eyes do not lie. And so, you wouldn't call yourself an expert DWI investigator. Oh, not by far. But you did your job. Not DWI. Not fair to say. Not your favorite crime to investigate or arrest or process. Definitely not my favorite. Okay, but you did your fucking job, and as brave as you were. On the night 
that that girl was going to kill herself. As brave as you were, dragging that bloodied fucking guy a hundred yards to the bus, equal, equally did you display your bravery. And I'll, let me tell you why. And again, I know this whole fucking episode sounds like I'm kissing his ass. Don't worry. After the podcast, we're going to go eat and I'm going to roast the fucking shit out of you. But <laughs> as brave as you were, right, because we've talked about this, you know, we'll run into the building, right? Oh, you know, you're busting for the fucking, you know, the crack pipe. Man, I got fucking Pablo Escobar off the streets. So, as brave as you were in doing the things that you did that earned you these, the, this, this, cr- these credentials, so too did you say, this is my job. It's your job to listen on the radio for this victim that you heard before because you recognize the address, you recognize the name. I think that in and of itself is a sense of duty. I think that shows character. It shows a sense of, hey, nobody, <laughs> I, I could not do it. But, but somebody's, somebody's watching, whether it's your God or Buddha, Vishnu, is that a thing? You know, whatever it is, right? Like, you do it because it's the fucking right thing to do. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. And it's a pain in the fucking tits. And it takes a lot of your time. Oh, absolutely. Especially when you're trying to get off and that call comes out and you're like, oh, man. Fuck. Yeah. But then the blood comes back two weeks later. Do you feel vindication? You know, I remember... When the blood got back, I was like, oh, hell yeah. Like, this dude was wasted. And, you know, I made a good call because I was, you know, I was a little worried. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, you know, HGN said one thing. Maybe he's got something else going on. I don't, I don't know, but. Hasn't taken a refresher, you know, in four years, you know. But. Uh, <laughs> if, <laughs> listeners, if you could see his face, you know. Now I'm confused because I thought yeah. you said the roasting was going to start at yeah, dinner. Yeah. But, uh, but, but, you know, when the blood comes back, it's tactile, right? It confirms, it's a, it's physical evidence of your kind of, it's a confirmation of your skills as an investigator. Right. It gives you, and honestly, it boosts your confidence a little bit too for the next one. You know, you you get that back and you're, hey, I made a good call. It boosts that confidence and all of a sudden they're not, they're not as scary. They're not as hard. That kind of thing. Yeah. And maybe on the next one, you'll kind of trust your instincts a little more. You know, because you'll be more confident for sure. Because you do have to trust your instincts in this job. You uh, do. I learned. How many plates did you let go and you let, it comes back, you know, 90 seconds after you turned right and he turned left and it, you know, fuck, there's a region or, you know, expired, like, man, I could have gotten them or whatever. I have uh, two themes uh, I like on this podcast. One is the thing that validated the reason you sign up for the job. And the second is I love investigating. I love investigations. It's difficult to do when you're running f- from job to job to job to job to job. But when you get into a small department, when you get into an executive position, administration, d- DT, you know, I mean, you know, detective, when you get into those positions, uh, I love the thrill of investigating, piecing together your evidence, finding that I fuck. I tracked him down, right? And I went to his social media and I went down to the date of the offense and I found out where he... I love in a good investigation. Have you had an opportunity to have either one of those calls where your reason for doing the job was validated or a good investigation story? You got anything like that for me? In your seven years of veteran experience? <laughs> hmm. Off the top of my head. I mean, you knew where... I just feel like, you know... You knew you were coming here to record this, right? Yeah. I, I asked for the yeah, question yeah, yeah. prior to coming here. No, and, but... Um, you know, I, I do like running yeah. through social media. You know, I'll try to find guys yeah. on social media. Um, I know there's a... Not me particularly, but, the, you know, there's there are units that run social media warrants. And mm-hmm. they'll get Glock switches and things like that mm-hmm. off, of, off of them. Or even UPF, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a guy... Mm. Nah. What's wrong? I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good story. And, you know, it happens a lot, too, where my speakers come on here, and they freeze up, right? And they won't tell a story. And then immediately after, well, you know, we'll go. I had a pre- previous guest who came on here, and then, like, after he did his interview, went over to his house, and we hung out. 
told me like 13 stories. I'm like, motherfucker, why did you fuck tell on the podcast? Yeah, it's hard to think of. Yeah, you I'm freeze fine. up. You freeze up a little bit, right? I don't want to call it freezing up, but I would. I would call. The, <laughs> is this not the fucking benchmark fucking definition of freezing up? Yeah, good sexual assault story or. You know, good dope case where the guy's lying to you, or and you find him. So like, actually, my first arrest was sex assault. Yeah. Um, Hold on, before you tell your first, I'm going to interrupt your very compelling story with a, with a, an anecdote. You do this, you go, ma'am. You shake your head as you're talking. Like, do you mind if I search your car? And she'll look up at you from the car. Like, uh, n- no. I know listeners can't see me, but you know, or uh, can you? You start nodding your head. You're like, sir. I can search your car, right? And the guy look, look up at you from the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can search my car. Yeah. So that's a that's a tidbit. But um, yeah, tell me about your first arrest. That's rare, right? To have a good pop like that on your first arrest. So, again, it was in the sometime in the early morning. By the way, if you'd like to move further away from your mic, there's another room back there that you can record from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So sex all comes there out. There we go. All right. Sex Jesus all comes Christ. out. They're, uh, it's coming out, and you know, we're trying to go there. You know, I got no idea where I'm going. I think it's day three. Or, got no idea where I'm going. Trying Are you to solo? Tell me. No. No. Oh, oh, first, oh you're, you're, you're like day third th- day, day three in the yeah. fucking in right. a uniform in a car. Right. Okay. All right. All right. You know, being told where to go. My trainer's telling me where to go, and call comments are updating that you know he. Sexually assaulted her. He beat her with a chain, which ended up being just a, a lanyard and some keys. And mm-hmm. I doubt that that even happened. Um, mm-hmm. It updates that this guy went to. He drives this car with this type of truck. I think it ended up being like a silver Nissan Titan or Frontier. I think is what it was. He ended up going to the somewhere off of. So we're going through the parking lot, and I'm like, I think that's his truck. Trainer's like, No, I think go go around the back. I think I'm like. That's him right there. So we, you know, mm. I jump out, hook him up. About the only good thing I actually did, right? <laughs> like, hey, that's the guy. Okay, I'm going to run out there, grab him, hook him up. We go back to the call location. We talk to the caller, and she's, her name was, you know, Methany or something. It's just, she's all doped out. She's all over the place. This guy's living, you know, he, he, he did all this stuff, and um, he did this and we went to the kitchen and he was doing this, you know, the friends kind of cooperating some of the stuff and we ended up getting him downtown while we're, we're downtown and the detectives are interviewing him. Like my, one of my classmates and his trainer took the complaint to the hospital. He, he texted, Hey, she, she ran out of the hospital. She's gone. Right. Oh shit. So we ended up, you know, booking him. I remember a couple months later, I'm, I'm at court and for, for, not for this case, for another mm-hmm. case. And I look up this case, and it, it's cleared. You're already at court a few months into field training? Yeah. Yeah, for, for, for low city stuff. Oh, oh, municipal yeah, yeah. court. Right, okay. right, right. All right. Like, what the fuck? Um, I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's probably I don't know, eight, nine months later. Sure, sure. Um, and I, I look at the case, and it's it's cleared out. And, and, I, and I read the details on mm-hmm. there, and this, this guy just OD'd. So that ended up being my first arrest was the sex assault, and mm-hmm. she runs out the hospital. It's just all okay, you know, it's first okay. time I'm experiencing any any anything close to this world. I'm but, interested to hear. Um, I mean, because it's all kind of mind boggling, but at some point you go home to tell your significant other, like, like, hey, I got my first arrest. I got my first whatever. This is what happened at work. And how do you tell somebody a story like that? I mean, how? how how does a civilian react to that kind of call? You know, I, sometimes I think you're like, oh, there's no, they don't, they don't believe this. Right. <laughs> they don't right. believe this is actually happening. But no, it's it's happening. Uh, about a year later, we made an, they made another sex assault arrest. Um, same guy that I was with whenever actually I wasn't riding with him this day, but he ended up we were on the same call together. Right, right. Now you're uh, well, now you're working side by side. Yeah. yeah, this guy literally gets out the, the day before, gets out of Dallas County for sex assault. Shocker. Staying at some, Shocker. Right. Staying at someone's apartment, ends up sexually you know, she alleges he sexually assaulted her and this is an active scene, you know, she escapes, the ambulance is there, we're all mm. there. Hook him up and when we're downtown and they have him, you know, taking picture of PES, is taking photos of him stuff, he looks up his shirt, he's got a sexual a sexual consent form tattooed to his stomach. 
And I always just thought that was that was crazy. Same guy jerked off in the in the room. Okay. So, in the same offense, he jerked off in the room. No, he was jerking off in the in the interview, interview room. room. Okay. Yeah. All right. Were you wearing something sexy? I mean, were you asking for it? Yeah. You can laugh. It's okay. Yeah. Were you like? I mean, did you have like something low cut? Is that what it was? Oh no, he had that muscle shirt from That's when he was nineteen. Was. Yeah, That's when he was, was. nineteen. So he jerks off in the, in the. Did you get him for like indecent exposure? Or nah, he's in he's in the room by himself. I mean, I, we're all in the I'm little a, TV a, room I'm watching offended. this. Yeah, I'm offended. <laughs> Just by here is the statute. Are we still within two years? Because I'm I'm offended. Um, you know, um, let me go back to that first caller of yours because um, it's a complicated case. It sounds like it wasn't a very sympathetic witness. Is is that, is that is that fair to say? Like the the victim wasn't a terribly sympathetic. Just the way you described her. I mean. No, I, I think what actually ended up happening with that was they called him over. They wanted some money to to buy drugs. He wouldn't give it to them. And uh, mm-hmm. I, you know, her. I truly believe her whole story ended up being bullshit. But oh, I see. But she's just. I think she was trying to get him in trouble at that okay. time. I'm not going to say that it, it doesn't happen. It definitely happens. No, no. I, I know. Trust me. I, I get it. But um, And so you're new on the job. This is day three. And do you do you parse that out in your brain where you're like, well, I was always taught that. Or do you instantly know? Do you have instincts like, oh, this is bullshit? Or, you know, is somebody telling you this? Are you impressionable? Are you formulating your own kind of independent thought? I mean, how do you how do you rationalize that in your brain? <laughs> No, you're definitely, I mean, the things, as far as the offense goes, she's, she's talking about this, but then the things she's going into, you can start to, her, her brain is cooked. You can, the things she's talking about, oh, he's, mm-hmm. he's, you know, hiding in the walls, and he's living in this little bag right here, this little gym bag. He, mm-hmm. he lives in this bag and watches us and spies on us, and it just, you start realizing, oh, okay, maybe this is. And you maintain the decorum of profession professionalism right you still have yes man because just because she's crazy doesn't mean she wasn't a victim of a crime like you gotta you know the truth will come out at some point and it's not really our place to arbitrate now look i get we can exercise discretion or cops can exercise discretion when they're but you know i mean you do have to take everything seriously right as we come to a close here um I'm most particularly interested in talking about sort of um, calls, and I, I, I love these types of calls where uh, it depends on your observation skills. You know, um, victim alleges that uh, husband pointed a gun at her, we can't find the gun, and I'm just doing my Columbo walkthrough of the house, you know, with my hands behind my back, and, you know, just kind of moseying on through the house, and I look down and I see the the butt of the gun sticking out from behind that box. Um, you know, do you think you're a pretty observant guy? And if, and if you are, do you have any good observation stories where you bust through the crime, you solve the crime, get, you know, a little, little Sherlock Holmes, Encyclopedia Brown, I guess, in your case? So, I'll tell you this story. Um, we get a domestic call, right? Second phase of training. My trainer tells me, hey, when you're, when you're writing stuff down, you don't, don't look at your whip-out book the entire time, right? Just just write, look around, always look around your surroundings. Like these people mm-hmm. out here are going to kill you. Cool. Something that's stuck with me. Fast forward four years, working in <laughs> I'm out there investigating the domestic, uh, like an ag assault, trying to kill her, was trying to kill the kid. I'm out there talking to a neighbor in the front yard and kind of have my back to him, to the street, across the street. There's another sidewalk on the other side, and there's a squad car between us and, and another officer. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting here talking to this guy because he witnessed this. And I turn, and I look, and I see this guy running down the street at us with a pistol in his hand. So, of course, I drop my shit, draw on him, prone him out, get the pistol as soon as I'm asking for more cover. And, to, and getting him detained, dispatch comes over and describes the guy that I have to me. And I'm... And she tells me, this guy, you know, we, we're getting a shooting and there's three victims down the street. So I feel like, you know, maybe doesn't hit your question to the T, but maybe no, the observation. Yeah. Um, yeah, having good observation, mm-hmm. just always being, you know, aware of your surroundings. That, that, that I would say it probably saved my life. I don't know if this guy would have killed us, but he definitely mm-hmm. would have had the opportunity had I not seen him. 
And so um, that draws us to uh, a finer point is always be aware, right? We're getting ambushed. So you, you, you do the smart things. You don't get complacent. You remember, you know, you remember the job. You, you, you always fight to win. So even the little things, you know, I will say this, right? The whole, like, you know, these cops are like, I was like, to like, they're off duty, right? And they go to eat with their spouses and their family. And they're like, bitch, get out the fucking chair. I can't have my back to the door. You know? And she's like, well, we're already sitting. Like, bitch, get out of the fucking chair. I'm a fucking cop. You know, like, I wasn't really always big on that. You know, like, like, look, I get it. You know, you probably shouldn't have your back to the door. But, like, the statistical likelihood of a fucking active shooter coming here into this, uh, you know, Italian restaurant, you know, that has the, you know, the kid's menu where, like, you know, you have to circle the fucking food that you want. Statistical likelihood very low. But, you know, something to be said for being on the job and on duty and just kind of always being aware, right? Like kind of, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, which is, you know, when you're on a car stop, you leave your door un unlatched, right? You kind of leave it slightly ajar. Right, right. Don't slam. Oh, God. Every fucking rookie I've ever trained. <laughs> License and insurance? Like, why are you getting out of the fucking car like that? But like these little things you do, right? So, you know, we, we, we want to always stay vigilant. We never want to get complacent because that's how cops fucking die. You know, gassing up the car, 7-Eleven, you know, or gas station, whatever, you know. And, and, and I see it too much. I see it too much. Cops on their phones at an off-duty. Off-duty, right? Standing there, facing the phone, no vest. You know, and, and I, I, I don't know how to combat that. But you bring, you bring it to a finer point. Um, how, do you, how do you stay sharp? I think some of it's like, you know, experience you know if nothing ever happens and yeah you're gonna start slipping i guess you know for lack of better terms um so let's hit, just yeah yeah but you just go ahead i'm sorry for interrupting you no i mean you, you, you gotta understand i mean you, there's people out there that want to hurt you and mm -hmm. you never know where they're gonna be at you just gotta keep keep watching for them um i never understood that either how people can like, especially not wearing your vest i, ne I never understood mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. And then if I'm going to hit one last point in relation to this particular segment, it's in the theme of bravery and the saving the jumper, blood, kids, domestic violence, DWI. Do you have the bravery to go to another officer and say, Bob, I, I love you. I think you're a great cop. You've got to wear your fucking vest. And I'm only telling you this because I care about you. Get off your phone. Stop walking around with your head in the clouds. Is that a form of bravery? I'd say so. Yeah. Would, would, you ever, I mean, would you ever do that? Would you ever be in a position to do that? You know, luckily the officers that I work with, never nobody ever just flat out didn't, didn't wear their vest, but... Or any similar, my, any similar behavior. Right. 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 You know, we, we were afforded back plates, right? Some guys wouldn't wear them because it was right. uncomfortable, and I'm like... You know what's really uncomfortable? A bullet to your back. That's mm -hmm. really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I did have a partner. Great partner. Mm -hmm. Love this dude. But mm -hmm. we started getting these back plates. Didn't want to wear it. Didn't want to wear it. Didn't want to wear it. And I'm like, you know what, dude? You got a daughter. Like, I'm not going to go to your daughter and be like, hey, dad was uncomfortable wearing a back plate. Sorry. What did your you partner know? say? He fought it. But he, you know, even when he was fighting, he'd be like, yeah, I know you're right. I know you're right. And he ended up wearing it. And first, you know long as we rode together he would wear it how much did you persist did you give up after the because oh, i da I, daily right i mean luckily he didn't take weeks or months but you know I, we we worked four tens and mm. i think by the end of the four tens he he mm. decided okay yeah you're right i'm gonna wear it good so final word on bravery which is hey bob these these plates are free just put it on right fuck, fuck you okay right and you know, I'm 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 gonna I'll, I'll, I'm lazy, fat fucking cop. I was like, all right, well, I told you once already, but you persisted because you cared about him. He understood you cared about right. him, and that's a form of bravery too, right? Keeping ourselves, keeping each other alive. It's come, I mean, you know, camaraderie and brotherhood, if you will. You should be able to call each other out. I would expect somebody to call me out. Yeah, I mean, as much as we get along and bullshit, we we can have arguments and disagreements too. We still love each other at the end. Right. Um, and the last story I'd like you to tell is uh, 
the time I almost dragged you into a DWI while we were both on duty. <laughs> yeah, so... We didn't work for the same department. We didn't, and I didn't work for that area either. Right, and you happened to be in that area because of a major incident that occurred nearby. Right. Another major incident happened brought us down there to help cover answer calls hey i'm in your area let's meet up at you know qt meet up at qt car crash minor right right in front of us dude shoving crackers down his throat i think you ended up we were like you know hey i'll do it (laughs) you know but uh you ended up doing sfsts and the dude dude wasn't intoxicated but he had consumed alcohol he definitely consumed alcohol but just wasn't he performed well during the SFSTs. You know what he was going to say, right? He was going to say the F word. Because it's not pass or fail. My man. All right, so we're driving around. We're going south on, on And we see this car, and I'm like, I bet that tag's fake. Porter runs the plate, comes back fake. So we light him up and pulls off onto, I think, or something like that. And we're sitting there talking to him. I run the VIN number through dispatch. We're both sitting there because we're... You know you don't have to say VIN number, right? That's redundant. What does the VIN stand for? Well, I know it makes you mad. Vehicle identification number number. So you run the VIN. You run the VIN. All right, so we we run the VIN, standing there at the driver window. Dispatch comes back. Actually, at at this point, I had actually opened up the driver door because you just know something's wrong. Sure. Dispatch comes back. Solo solo driver? Solo driver. Hmm. So she comes back, you know, Echo, I'm not going to say that element number, but, you know, Echo, whatever. Yeah, that, that just so nonchalantly comes back, that, that car's stolen. So, also, you know, like, re- goes, re- repeat? <laughs> like, can I confirm the VIN? You know, because it, 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 it's, it, um, when you get a stolen in a non uh, high risk, scenario like if you're behind a car you run the plate and it comes back stolen you're like all right this is gonna be good right right <laughs> when you're just out with somebody or you're like towing an abandoned vehicle it's like stolen you're like what <laughs> hey sad again <laughs> so i rip, rip him off the door throw him on the ground cuff him up and he's lying to us about his name we know he's lying he's lying he's lying 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 you had to throw him on the ground a stolen car <laughs> Just get on, like, can you come over here and talk to me and just put him in the car? No, he's, he's still in the car. He didn't have to get him on the fucking ground. Like, Jesus. <laughs> he needed to go on the ground. Boy. Hardcore. So, Good thing he was Asian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he keeps lying to us about his name. It's obvious it's not him. There's a huge weight difference, facial features, mm-hmm. a lot of things that are different. It's obvious. So I give him till You ran the info he gave you. It comes back to somebody completely different. Can I, right. Right. So I'm telling him, hey, you got to you got to the top of the elevator. We were at jail. I'm like, you got to the top of the elevator. I'm a live scan. You fingerprints are coming right. back. I, I know who you are. Right. Or I'm going to know who you are. Right. So I get, him to the top of the, I get him to the top of the elevator. He still doesn't. We it's, get, it's two floors, by the way. So, yeah. Well, I mean, he had the ride <laughs> down there. <laughs> he had some time to come clean. Bing, bing. Right. So it's like eleven seconds. We we get around. We go to the we go to the booking. And we start talking about live scan, and he's like, "I, I gotta tell you something." Tells me his real name. We run it. He's got multiple county warrants out of different counties. He's got one for failed ID fugitive. So, and I told, I told him, you know, if, when I find out who you are, I'm charging you with everything. He had some paraphernalia stuff in there that I typically wouldn't throw on them if I was already going to take them for UUMV. But one of the, it was, it was kind of a field good arrest too, because he had a, an ag sex assault against a child warrant. So, which is ultimately why he was lying. So we ended up charging him with all of his, obviously all of his warrants and failed ID fugitive and the UMV and the paraphernalia and the was it fake a, tag. For the ag assault or for the uh, ag sex assault uh, child warrant, was it? It was fresh. It, it was a fresh PC fresh warrant, warrant. PC warrant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's good, man. Good stop. Right. And that was a fake tag. You had the opportunity to pull. This was back in the big city. So you had a lull and you had the opportunity to make the cost stop. Right. And you could have just banged out the summons and, you know, gone about your way summons them for you know whatever right wrong plate and so um 
full disclosure to our listeners, my, my guest was kind of, you know, like debating like whether or not to tell the story. Um, but um, I said, no, I'll tell it because I want to point out that not every, not every cop, this isn't how all cops are built. Ladies and gentlemen who are, I mean, even cops, right? But you're, t- hey, taxpayers out there, this is what you pay for. This is the return on investment you get for your taxes. You know, when people, we stop people and they're like, yeah, pay pay your fucking taxes. This is your taxes right here. This is what you pay for. You know, do, do you ever take stock in that? Do you ever, you, do you, under, you understand that, right? I mean, it's a feel-good arrest, but I mean, you understand, right? You're doing the thing that, that you swore to do. Right. And it makes you different. It does. It, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like yeah. you're fulfilling that, that role that you decided to, mm-hmm. to do, you know? So I mean, it, our conversation in the parking lot, in Dickies, you know, this is it. Right. You find, you lived up to the commitment. And how was the car taken? It was just straight you. Straight you. It wasn't, wasn't an ag or anything right. like that. It was good. Right. I think keys were left in it, probably at some gas station somewhere, and they drove off with it. I actually tried to get another officer, Bob, to come and interview, but he decided that, the, at least at the time, that he didn't want to. Sure. This is kind of one of those once in a career things. Like, I I highly doubt I'll ever see this. So we get a shooting call one day, and we're going to it, and we're kind of, the call comments are coming out that the, the weapon for the shooting, it wasn't a gun. It was a crossbow. So we get there, and this dude... And I really wish this other officer would come and talk because he was he was first out. You know, we got mm-hmm. there and we saw it, but he was first out, and this was actually his, his arrest. You know, it's kind of one of those arrests where you're like, no, <laughs> you're not taking this one for me. Like, I'm I'm writing this. Absolutely. So we get there, and this dude's got an arrow sticking out of his chest, and his the back his back skin is teeping. Like the pressure from the arrow has gone through him, through his just his chest, and it's pushing the skin out, but hasn't quite broken it yet. And to us, that was, that was crazy. Like, you, we, we'd go to shootings, and it's obviously always a gun. But right. you, you get there, you go to a shooting, and you get there, and this dude's got an arrow sticking out of his chest. And I remember the, the you know, I'm sure, you know, they got the arrow sticking out the back is probably why. But they they made him walk, and this dude's kind of falling over. Yeah. And they're holding, holding him up, walking him to the, to the, the deal. But this guy gets up out of the living room and walks from his living room with some assistance, but he's walking to the ambulance with an arrow sticking out of his chest and we ended up we ended up finding the guy underneath a, a bridge was this random a random no oh. he, he ended up calling his mom and saying hey i'm under a bridge he was completely psychotic he thought that this his roommate was sleeping with his wife that he hasn't been married to in some years and she lives on the other side of the state like mm. nowhere yeah this you know wasn't happening at all not to mention this guy you know, was living there with him, his wife, and the guy who shot him with an arrow. But we just kind of thought that was a bizarre. That was one of the. I remember the detective coming out and saying, "You're never going to see this again." Did the victim make it? He did. He went under a 27-hour operation, mm-hmm. and he made it. I believe it was 27 hours, but 27 hours, and he lived. <clears throat> I want to know more about the uh, the archer. Um, I mean, we can't call him a shooter, right? So, like, I'm imagining like. He's trying to hide the bow, you know, like in his shirt, and it's like poking, <laughs> and he's like, Help, "Good, good morrow to you, constables." What seems to be amiss, you know? I mean, did he? Where was the bow? I mean, did he? He, he left it. He ran out the back and he left it. Oh man! Up. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't that cool. Damn. Sorry. Did he have a quiver, you know, like like where he, like Just like he's Robin Hood? It. Yeah, yeah. Like I want to picture at least like when you caught up to him, right? He had the quiver, right? With a bunch of arrows in it, and he's like, "Me? No. What makes you think that I was the shootest? What was perchance? You know, like I, I, do, I do want him to be like super, like so, so. What was his condition when you saw him? None of that. No, no other arrows or quivers or. No, he he was just hiding underneath one of the bridges and mentally unstable. He he cooperated and went into cuss and went down and talked and he t- he said he's. He's actually the one who told us, like, oh, the guy's sleeping with my wife and all, all this stuff. Right. But was he a felon? Did you charge him with like UP? P? That's the last joke I'll make about it. <laughs> I 
personally never arrested anybody for prostitution. Actually, that's a lie. Uh, at my current department, it wasn't technically my arrest, but I helped with this whole operation. Um, they had a massage parlor. For I, I'm not going to say the name of it, but they had a massage parlor. So I'm going to take we, a wild shot in the dark at the cli- at the uh, employment at the employees. Right? Hold on. Jewish. Am I, am I wrong? Wrong? I'd be wrong. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let me take another shot. Hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second. Okay, hold on, hold on. All right. Um, hold on, hold on. I'm going to guess, uh, based on current events, Ukrainian. G- uh, unscrupulous massage parlor staffed by Ukrainians. No, no, wrong? Wrong? Okay. All right. Would you like to tell our audience what, what, what the uh, racial makeup of the unscrupulous massage parlor staff was? Asian. Are you? I'm, I'm hold on. I'm gonna back up from the mic. God. So, you know that somebody online complaint, whatever it was. So they who's that? Asked guy? me to. I want to find that guy. All right, rat it out my fucking rub and tug. I'll be right, right, motherfucker. Right. right. Like I live in this shitty small ass town. Hold on a second. This white ass, shitty small ass town. I got nothing else going on in my life. My wife's got a fat ass, all right? She can't cook, hate my fucking kids. And every Thursday or every Friday night at around this time, I go to Happy Feet. That's not the real name of the place. And this bitch dined, some, some bitch dined this place out to the fucking cops. You know, can a guy get a rub and tug plus a half and half for $73 without the man coming in? To, so this, by the way, you know this is how the interviews typically go, right? You start a story, and then I interrupt it with a fifteen-minute <laughs> joke monologue, a monologue bit about the about the. I mean, you opened it up, right, with the massage place. It's kind of your fault, right? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I'll so someone that. someone makes an online complaint. So they make an online complaint. We and this is actually the second time we've done this, and I was part of the first one too. We made so we go, they send in covers. They go, they sit in the parking lot. Hey, this this guy walked in. Okay, however long he's in there, he comes back out, gets in a car, drives off. This car, make, model, great if we can get a license plate, this direction, which luckily there, there really wasn't a lot, a lot of places to go. It was either you went south on the service road or you went mm. through the parking lot. That's really it. Mm. So I end up, my, my role in all this was I was stopping the cars. Mm-hmm. And then while I was doing my normal, you know, either writing citations or, or warnings or whatever I was doing, these guys are getting hemmed up by the detective. They're, they're getting questioned about, hey, why are you going in there? What are you doing? Did any of this happen? You know, just things like that. So some of the guys, you know, would admit, yeah, I paid X amount for this. They end up... For a rusty trombone. Or it was all hand jobs, you know, middle school stuff, but... Do you know what a rusty trombone is? Please do explain. It's not a hand job. No. Well, I can touch so, that. So they, so you're, you make the stop for, you know, whatever, and then the unmarked comes up behind you. Right. The yeah. CID would right. come up yes. and talk right. to them right. and get whatever information they needed. Some, some people talked. Some other people didn't. Um, they ended up getting enough for PC to, for for a warrant. Mm-hmm. And they, they go in and they actually send a, one of the covert guys in there, mm-hmm. and he gets offered, you know, for. However much for a hand job, and they, we ended up going back in and, and arresting her for prostitution. So mm-hmm. that would be my prostitution story. He's skipping over one very major detail. How did your buddy talk himself out of the blowjob? How did your buddy talk himself no out of the idea. HJ? I, probably typical. Oh, yeah, I can't do this. I got a wife, you know, things like that. Uh, no, I'm not buying that shit. Because. It would take the will of God, Buddha, Vishnu, and uh, what's the fate? The flying spaghetti monster. Allah. Yeah, I don't give a fuck. Come at me. Uh, <laughs> to fucking be like, ma'am, uh, Sun Yi, or whatever the fuck. Like, you know? Like, $40? Yeah, that's it? Yeah, right. Okay. Pay 80 last time. Yeah, 358 I'm out of service. You know, like, like you know, it's, like, uh, we're canceled. Yeah, you're ripping. You're, you're, oh, you're doing that thing in the departed where you're ripping off the wires and throwing it into the fucking toilet, you know? Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, how do you get that gig, right? You know, like, also, like, all right, boys, gather around. Who wants to volunteer for uh, 
operation. Uh, you know, uh, what is what, what's another good name? Uh, happy Happy Fee, or you know, like uh, 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 number one Asian or number one Asian massage, right? You know, like who wants who who wants to sign up for the uh, how many fucking hands just go flying off, right? Right? <laughs> right? You're like you, Bob. Put your fucking hand down. You went last time. You know? Thanks so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing. Please rate and review the show and follow us on all platforms. You can hear us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Our website is nfipodcast.com, YouTube at NFI Podcast, and please reach out to us at podcast at nfipodcast.com. New episodes released weekly or whenever I feel like it. Help us spread the show, tell us what you think, and Put a buddy on. I'll see you out there. Stay safe and remember, do your job. <laughs>